So here we are. Here's our board. And uh, now we're basically down to the grabbing parts and putting them on the board. So this part is going to be kind of boring for the next half hour as I put these boards on. So what I do is uh, let me zoom out a little bit so you can see what I've got and then I'll zoom back in. Um, so if I lift up, you'll see over here, I got my bill of materials with all the parts and I'm just going to start. Um, actually, I'll probably put the wire antenna on. Well, nah. Actually, <laughs> right from the get go, I'm going to violate the rules. I'm not going to put the antenna on before we put this in the reflow oven. Because once I put this antenna on, since it, it's it's going to make the whole board sit awkward on the table, um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be moving this around a lot, and it sits off the edge, so it, it would it would be a nuisance. So this will get soldered on after the fact. So we'll save this, the antenna for later. But basically, I'm going to work down the bomb, take all these parts, put them on the board, and they're all labeled. I if I didn't screw up, every single part on this board should have a label on the silk screen. It's called. On the on the board itself, using sort of standard electrical naming conventions, C's for capacitors, R for resistors, that sort of thing. Let me see. Give me the best view I can give you here. That camera's a little blurry, but you're going to have to live with it. Okay, so here is my first set of capacitors. I've got four capacitors at 0.1 microfarad, and so capacitors, single uh, surface mount capacitors, don't have any markings on them. They're usually just sort of this brown with two ends. So it doesn't, there's no orientation to them. You don't have to worry about top or bottom or anything like that. So I just have to stick them on the board. So first is C1 and I got to figure out where C1 is. So C1, um, now a little bit about how, how the board um, is set up. You'll notice that we have some lettering horizontal and some vertical. If the lettering is horizontal, the part goes horizontally. If the lettering is vertical, the part goes vertically. So C1, I see C1 here written vertically. So C1 is going to be these two pads right here. Um, I'm sorry the camera's a little blurry. So I'm just going to grab this tiny resistor and I'm going to put it on the two pads for C1 and just drop it. And now it's the test of how much caffeine I had. You want to have enough caffeine to be effective and not too much to have shaky hands. So there's a, a fine line to be to balance here. All right, next one is C5. So, so again, this is going to be a little bit of a boring part because you're just going to have to watch me stick a, about 50 parts on this board. Uh, and I got to find them, which, and this is the first time I built this board, so it's not wrote to me yet. Uh, C2, C6. Ugh. If anybody wants to call out a quadrant, let me know. Okay, C5, where are you hiding? Oh, here it is. It's a vertical part and it's sort of in the middle there, right there. So you want to line it up sort of centered over the pads. You want each end in the solder paste, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to mash it into the paste. You just want to set it down. Um, when the reflow happens, the, uh, the solder will reach up and embrace the part and uh, it won't be a problem. Uh, C11 is my next one. And these are all 0.01, so these are like decoupling caps. So they should all be around components probably. There's C11. So this is where steady hands are good. And it doesn't have to be like this one's a little off. Again, the magic of reflow soldering is when this gets hot, the solder is going to melt and the parts are going to float in the solder. And then as it heats up a little bit more, the, the rosin will make the, the metal of the solder grab onto the metal of the part and the, the parts will actually rotate and shift and align themselves um, sort of magically. So as long as they're sort of on all the pads, they'll take care of business for themselves. Um, C18 is right there. So that's my point one microfarad caps. So next, 470 puff. Sounds like another project you need to do is get a camera mounted into your reflow oven so we can actually see that happening. And yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to, this camera that we've got, I'm going to spin around. Um, I did bench test that yesterday. I should be able to spin it around so you can see. Yeah, you're probably not going to be able to see that because the, uh, the glass on this $10 reflow oven is not that good. So it kind of fogs up. Let's see, C2. But uh, there are actually some wonderful illustrations. If you just go on YouTube and like, Google or look for reflow 
know, SMD reflow or something like that. There are some people who have great visualization of it, and it is really a, a sight to see. Um, I do recommend looking for it. C10. Yep. I got a C10 on here somewhere. There it is. And then my filter chain. Okay. A little off. So, as I say, 0603, I find it be, you know, big enough. It's not really a problem to work. 0402, sometimes what I do is I grab this tiny little pick. And after I drop it on the board, I may adjust it with the pick. Because 0402 are so small, that surface, that the static, just the ambient static in the air will cause the parts to stick to the to the um, uh, tools. Um, okay, so, um, so it's a summertime project. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you, you definitely want to work in a, a, a humid environment. It's not a bad thing. Um, okay, so part number four, I'm a little confused about because I am seeing four capacitors in here. Why am I seeing four capacitors? Did I goof somehow? 0.47. I may have miscounted or I may have done a stupid. Let's see. Because there are four caps in that and there should only be two. So I'll grab my multimeter and see if I can get a reading. I just want to make sure I'm not too crazy. These should be 0.47 microfarad, which I should be able to read on even this meter. Keep it in view. Yeah, I can't really. You have to trust me. And again, dra not dragging anything through the middle. My solder paste. 204 nanofarad. Oh, I know what this is. I know. Yeah, 205 nanofarad. I know what this is. <laughs> this is intentional. I forgot. I misread my, my bill of materials at first, and these are supposed to be 0.47 microfarad, and I thought I had 0.47 microfarad caps in my parts bin, and I didn't. So what I did is I, instead of using two 0.47s, I'm using four 0.22s. So my intention was to set aside an extra couple and stack them. Um, so I'll probably stack them after I do the build. So what I'm gonna do is take the two extras here and Quite honestly, it probably doesn't matter for this application. Um, I think they're mostly used for decoupling if they're that large. So the fact that they're a little low in uh, capacitance is probably not going to be a problem. This should be C3 and C6. Okay. But you can do that. You can take, you know, these parts and stack them. You can, you know, do crazy stuff like that. C3 and C6. Oh, yeah, because these are part of my filter. Oh, these are, oh, these are my filter chain. No. That's right, these are decoupling caps outside of this um, here. So that should, yeah, these are just decoupling caps. So whether they're 0.2 or 0.4 is probably not that big a deal. All right, uh, C4 and C9, that's part five. All right, these are gonna be part of my filter chain because these are nine puffs, so. C4 and C9. So if you if you decide to stack components, Mike, um, do you run one component through on the reflow oven and then try and stack one by hand later? That's what you... I'm going to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's exactly what I'll do. Is I'll I'll put one on the board. If I have trouble, <laughs> which I doubt I'm gonna, um, and I and I'm suspicious of that. Then what I'll do is I'll hand solder the the uh, additional cap on top. Okay. Um, all right. So that was that. This one's 15 puffs, C7 and 8. So you can see how getting these parts out in advance, see how tiny they are. They're kind of fussy to, to work with. Yeah, these are part of my low-pass filter chain. This is uh, transmitting at 144 megahertz APRS frequency, but I, I made the low-pass filter 400 uh, 440 megahertz, just C7, C8. Um, just in case, for whatever reason, if I want to send some UHF through here, um, it's going to make a, a whopping 10 milliwatts. So it's not exactly like, uh, you know, we're going to kill anybody if we have a, a little spurious transmission from 10 miles up at, at 10 milliwatts. 
Um, okay, so this is part number seven. Okay, we're on to the next row of parts. Part number seven is a 56 nanofarad C12. So the problem with capacitors and the other reason to keep them all in separate little jars until just before you need them is there's no markings whatsoever and they all look the same. So if you have a bunch of these surface mount caps laying around and you bump the pile, um, which I've done, I used to set all the parts right on this piece of paper with my bill of materials until about the second or third time I bumped the piece of paper and all the parts moshed together. And uh, at which point, you know, you scrape all the capacitors out and you throw them away because, you know, it's, a lot of caps are even kind of hard to measure with a multimeter. Uh, C33 is a one microfarad. Um, so these little, these little cups I really love. I'd be, I've really become sold on the notion if I have anything significant to do, then I'm going to use little cups. C33 is a one microfarad. This has got to be decoupling something. Yeah, let's see here. All right, and that is it for my caps. Now diodes, oh, surface mount diodes are fun because um, they're damn impossible to see. So I've got three of them. I've got a green, a blue, and a red. So part number nine is my diode. So as tiny as these are, they actually light up pretty good. What I'm gonna do is I'd like to show you one of the diodes in the, the camera. Because being a diode, the direction matters. Um, so I wanna show you what a surface mount diode looks like on the bottom. So let me slide this over so it's a little bit out and clear. All right, so there's my surface mount diode. And you can see, you might see through the top here a little bit of a marking on the bottom of these diodes. And I'm hoping I can, flipping these is always a pain in the butt too. Ah, because they are, you know, raised up on the top. I may have to flip this over and just hold it. See if I can do that. Ah, of course not. Just as I got it flipped, I dropped it. Trying to get it in the camera. I see it happening any minute now. It's going to go paching and go flying across the room. And I'll be going to my parts bin to get another one. Trying to get it flipped so I can show you on camera. Okay, there we go. Aha. So you can see on the bottom, pretty big arrow. So on the bottom of these parts, they put a big arrow and that points toward ground. So when you're doing surface mount LEDs, you flip them over, you look for the arrow and, and you point the arrow toward ground. So that's that's the trick with these. So let me go back to the other camera. So on this board, my LEDs are right here, D1, D2, D3. And uh, here's my current limiting resistors. I have 330 ohm resistors here. And the power comes down from the pins here. So basically, if I pull one of these pins high, it uh, sends positive through here through a resistor into the diode. And the other end of these diodes just goes into the ground plane. So um, uh, this end of these resistors is all just on the, the copper ground plane that's on the whole board. So what I need to do is point the arrow to the left. So, oh, sure. I, I, I flipped that and it, it landed upside down with the arrow up pointing at God and everybody. Okay, so this is D1. Arrow is pointing to the left. And there we go. So that's how you do the diodes. You have to sort of flip them over, find the arrow, point it to the ground. And it helps if you either have markings on your board. I didn't put markings on this board. You know, a lot of times with a diode, you'll put the, the bar marking for ground. And I just noticed that the, actually, I guess they are on this board. You can't, they're hard to see. Let me see if you can see it. Put it on the microphone, microscope. Yep, so you see the white bar at the uh, the right-hand side there, so that's the ground side. 
for the diode. So the markings are in the silk, but the, it's just so small, it's hard to see. So you see the diode sitting there, it's a little crooked, um, but it's sitting in the paste and it'll straighten itself out after we do the reflow. So there we go. And it's like, wait a minute, no, I didn't intentionally put markings on the board, but when you do a diode, it automatically does that for you. So, all right, so D, part number 10 is D2, which I already put out, and fortunately have it in the sense line. Here's my diode, my arrow is, I double my magnification. Well, that's interesting. The markings on this diode are different. It's got a horizontal line across the middle. <laughs> Not helping much. I'm seeing this right. Wow. Let's see if I can get this under the microscope so you can see the so I had some diodes that were from a different manufacturer. And it's like, eh, a diode's a diode, I'll use it. But uh, maybe not. So what the hell does that marking mean? <laughs> That's helpful. Isn't it though? It's like right down the middle. Uh, well, let me flip it right side up. Maybe you can tell by looking at the top. I'm not used to looking at the top, but maybe. Oh, no, it's still upside down. Yeah, now I can't get it to sit right side up. Oh, can you test it with the diode function on your multimeter? No, that's a good idea. I might just do that. I mean, either that or I just put it on the board and if it doesn't work, I can take it off later. I'm, uh, I'm pretty comfortable with, with uh, doing surgery on boards, even with these tiny parts. Yeah, there's no real markings on that side either, are there? Okay, well, yeah, let's try the multimeter trick. So let me set it on the board. I'm gonna set it down and try not to mess up the orientation. One, one thing I noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, one thing I noticed there too, and using your diode tester would be easier, but when you're showing us that other diode on the, on the microscope, you could see how there was a, a wire that went to the top of the diode. Uh -huh. And then, you know, that went to one side or the other. It, and I see that that second one you showed, you can see the wire on it as well. Oh, ah, okay. So and, that would and be I guess, I, you know, I don't know when they manufacture them, if, if they're, you know, the substrate is always one polarity and then the the uh, the light emitted part would be the other polarity where the wire goes, but whether that would work or not, I don't know. I I guess if you got to the point where there's no other way to tell and you had a 50-50 shot at it, it might give you a little better odds. Uh, you know what? Unlike those resistors, I think the pads on this don't stick out the end of the part. Boy, that thing's tiny. It looked to me as though one end of that diode had a little dimple in it. Well, on the edge. Yeah, I can't tell with the multimeter. So it's either going to be an eyeball or a guess. Let me see what I see here. Can you zero in on that again? Yeah, give me just a second. I'm looking under magnification too. Just, mm. yeah, let me, okay, I'll put it back under the microscope. Gives me as much a chance to get a better look at it as you. Thank you. Yes, I think. Well, maybe it's just the perspective. On one edge, it looks like a dip in it, and it's straight on the other edge. Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry, it was the perspective. Uh, no, I can't see any difference between the ends either. Yeah. Like there's a dot in the upper right hand corner. Figure that out with the diode test. That's a bummer. I'm looking at it, trying to look at it side on to see the chances I can get this to lay on its side. 
I got two chances. Slim and no. Uh, oh, almost. Diodes are the worst. I they drive me crazy because you're doing this all the time. You're you're fighting with them. Ah, uh -huh, I got it on edge. Yeah, it doesn't even have a high side really. Great. Well, I could do two things. I could either just like put three volts into it and uh, test it, or I can just stick it on the board and test it. And I'm gonna. I have a friend who says when you have a 50-50 chance, nine times out of ten, you're gonna guess wrong. Um, but I'm just gonna throw it on there, and if it doesn't work, I'll flip it around. All right, turn off that light so you don't have a stroke with me. Okay. Put this light down a little bit. Even that light does it. You can't get incandescent bulbs anymore. Even this, you know, what looks like an incandescent bulb is a fluorescent and it's given these problems. All right, so it's a crapshoot. We're guessing. Well, there's, there's always Carson's theorem uh, for statistics. If, if you have a 50-50 chance of getting it right and you think about it, you have a 100% chance of getting it wrong. <laughs> That I will certainly attest to. That theorem is, is proven in my case. Oh, son of a gun. Same problem with this one. You know what? I'm going to take those other these other resistors. I'm just using them because I didn't want to throw them out. But this is annoying enough. I have no freaking clue. The only thing I can say is this one pad on the bottom, I didn't notice that. I noticed, sort of noticed that, but didn't think about it. Let me put it under the microscope again and show you. That little dot that shows up on the top side? No, actually on the bottom, one side has two dots and one side has three. Huh? And the side with three almost looks like an arrow. Fighting with this to get it right side upside down. I think I Got it backwards, but let's. Uh... Yeah, so do we consider that one that where the pad is bigger is an arrow pointing the other way? Well, I don't know. <laughs> sure, 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 <laughs> sure. Yeah, and this one's different, right? It doesn't have that little bar, it just has the three whatevers. So yeah, I've got three different LEDs from three different manufacturers doing three different things to me. I gotta turn this light on for a minute. All right, so this one, I gotta spin. This way. So I think what this is telling me is I'm gonna go back into those bags and throw away the LEDs from these manufacturers. <laughs> or I'm gonna make notes on the bags about, you know, what it, you know, this one, the arrow almost kind of makes sense. So that might be all right. But the other ones, ugh. Okay, that's my diodes. Now I'm down to some inductors. So bin 12, we're getting there. The resistors will take a little extra time, then it'll go real fast. The big parts go fast. All right, so inductors are, oops, I'm still on the micro, microscope, sorry. So these inductors are part of my filter chain L1 and L3. And the lettering is vertical, so the part goes on vertically. And that's bin 12, bin 13 is L2. So this is a two stage Sebeshev filter. And I just used the filter calculator on the web. So this inductor, oh, this inductor's a little worth looking at. These are a nuisance as well, but probably in a good way. So this is a tiny little inductor, 0603. You see the wire wrapped around it. And if I lay it on its side, you can see it's got pads on the bottom and it's blue on the top. And pretty much anytime you drop this, it's gonna land turtle <laughs> with the feet sticking in the air. So the trick with these parts is to get it flipped over so the blue is up. And that's that's up. So uh, 
these are fussy, but as long as you know blue has to be up, you're okay. So this is L2. Let me uh, switch cameras. The exciting part's coming. Not too long now. All right, but we got to get through the resistors. All right. Okay, bin 14 is my 10K resistors. And I set those two special ones aside. Those are going to be for my voltage divider, which are R12 and R15. So I'm not going to do those two, but I'll do all the rest. I've got R1. So the resistors have markings, black mark or black on top. Um, if you pay extra on these tiny little resistors, you can actually get the markings with the value on top. Um, but that actually you have to pay extra for. And it's enough extra. I mean, not like these, especially 10K resistors. <laughs> I got a funny story about 10K resistors. So I bought, I went to buy some 10K resistors and I looked at the pricing and I wanted to buy a hundred. Usually when I buy surface mount parts, if they're plentiful parts, I buy, um, I round up to two bucks worth. So if, I'm buying something like a 10K resistor, two bucks worth can be a lot of resistors. So I looked and two bucks worth was 100 10K resistors. So I'm like, okay, well, that's, a, that's gonna last me a long time, awesome. So I keyed into the website, 100, went on and ordered the 10 or 15 other parts I was going, doing. I'm looking for R5 as I'm talking and I'm failing. Um, there it is. R5 and R6 are right next to each other. Um, so I put it in, I ordered all my other stuff. I looked at the end of the order and you know, it's like 30 bucks worth of parts. Great, hit go. Four or five days later, my parts come in the mail and I pull out a reel of 1,002. They gave me a reel of 1,000 plus two more because I typoed. And I got 1,002 10K resistors for like $4.50. And it was so little more, you know, instead of two bucks worth, it was four bucks for a thousand. And because it was only two bucks more, I didn't even notice. <laughs> you know, I kind of glanced down. Yeah, it looks right about 31 bucks, whatever. Hit buy. Yeah. So I ended up with a thousand and two 10K resistor. So if you ever need an 0603 10K resistor, I can hook you up. Uh, let's see, R13 is the last one. Yeah, so my rule of thumb, am I slowly sliding off camera here? Um, my rule of thumb is with these you know, sort of passive components is buy two bucks worth um, and just, just have them. All right, and I put the two that were matched in this container. Oh my God, they landed right side up for a change. And these are gonna be my voltage divider, which I know are 12 and 15. All right, so that's those. We're in the home stretch now. My 330 ohm resistors, and then I got three components after this, and we're ready to bake it. Okay, 330s, pretty much every other resistor on the board. Not pretty much every other resistor on the board. Um, so I used a 330 with each of my diodes, so one there. So again, I'm working with magnification, so this isn't very hard for me to see, even though you know I'm wearing my transitions lenses. And I'm you know old man with bifocal type thing. Um, I can't see anything close up without my glasses. But with my glasses on and my magnification, 0603 is not difficult for me to work. But I've always had pretty steady hands. If you've got shaky hands, this is not the game for you. <laughs> Um, okay, and my last resistor was 2, 3, 4, and 14. So 14 is on my board in a place. There it is. So that's all the resistors. So now all I have left is my three bigger chips. So this is my barometer slash 
um, temperature sensor. I'm going to throw this under the microscope just so you can see it. I'll do that with each of these parts just so you can get a look at what they look like. Um, the markings on this part are similar with dip packages. They'll put a dot where pin one is. So this one has a very clear, easy to see dot on it. So that's pretty easy for pin one. Um, pretty much any surface mount component like this will use a dot. There are some that the dots are easier to see than other. That one's there in front of God and everybody, you can't miss it. I've got one that even under magnification, I have to hold it and turn it to the light to see that stupid dot in it, because you know, it's a tiny, that component that I'm talking about is probably a third of the size of this. And it's a black rectangle with a gray white dot, very faint gray white dot. And every time it's a fight. When I finally see it, I see it okay, but it's usually holding it at different angles and different lighting until I spot it. Um, okay, so this one, and there should be, let me bring my board up. This is U1. And on my circuit board, it's right there. And you see on the silk screen for the board, you see a white dot there. So basically you line up dot for dot on the board. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. I won't bother switching cameras for you. This is pretty straightforward. Just make sure I put the dot in the right corner. And these bigger components are the ones where after you lay them down, it's good not to slide them around too much because it'll mush the paste around. Okay, so the next one is actually my, um, this is the clock generator chip, which actually generates the RF. And this one is even so nice. They have the part number on it and everything, SI5351. Um, and you see the dot just fine there. And you see some schmutz, but there's, you know, there's the schmutz and uh, there's my dot right there. Um, and this piece, this part has the pins on the bottom. And uh, so these, these are tricky to, these can be hand soldered, believe it or not, but you have to design your board specially. When you design your board, what you do is, where the this layout is, you make each of these fingers extra long. So when you put the, the the part down, you've got little copper fingers sticking out all sides of the part. And that way, when you you uh, do it with a soldering iron, you slather a whole bunch of flux in there, and you rake solder across those pins, and uh, it'll go under the board. Um, so uh, so this one, the dot, of course, two different nomenclatures is. Uh, uh, a hack corner there. So this little corner is pin one. And I got to put, you know, that dot basically over pin one. So it's going to go sit on here like EA, you know, but straight. So I'll put it on here and then we'll go to the next one. Almost to the oven, one part after this. So here, what I'm doing, what I did is I held it over the spot until it was just about lined up and then I just dropped it and it landed crooked and now I'm just fussing with it eyeballing trying to get it as centered as possible over the, uh, the stuff so let me slide this under there to see, see see how I did so there it is and you can see my uh, the fingers are sticking out on each side and it's centered over all of those fingers and the pin is over where the notch was or the dot is over where the notch was. So that's in the right orientation. So that should reflow onto that, that spot just fine. And now the last one, which is embarrassing. Okay, this one right here, Y1. This, this is a temperature controlled oscillator. Since this is gonna be a balloon tracker, um, I wanted this, this part so you have it instead of just putting a crystal on here, I got a TCXO. Uh, and of course, it's an oddball part. And my dip tray software didn't have a, lay, a pin layout for it. So I had to design the pads for it. And if you look at those pads carefully, you'll notice that uh, top to bottom, there's a bigger gap than left to right. You see the difference there? And I goofed. <laughs> I just plain goofed. Uh, I put pin, you know, I, I did, I turned it 90 degrees when I laid the pins out. Um, so uh, we're going to be putting this board on sort of widthwise when it should be lengthwise or vice versa. But you see those pads are pretty symmetric and pretty square, so I should get away with it. 
I did confirm after I made that mistake that I didn't make any other mistakes, like the wrong pin out or anything. And I didn't. So all the pins are right. It's just that I'm going to be putting a square peg in a round hole, or at least a long peg in a narrow hole kind of deal here. So let me, I'm looking at the part and I see the dot. And I'm just got to turn 90 degrees this way. Yeah, okay, so I'm putting a long part on a narrow set of pads and centering the best I can. And subsequent to finding this mistake, I went ahead and went into the software and corrected it and actually saved it as version 1.1 of this board. So if I ever reorder the board, I'll upload the latest version and it'll be corrected on the next, next boards I order because um, I'll probably start with version 1.1 is, is my base. So there it is, center it up there. Um, my wart, you know, it's, it's sort of lengthwise. So you see those pads are sort of sticking out the top and bottom because they're a little too long, but I think it's gonna work just fine that way. Um, so I think we're good. So this board is now fully populated and now it's the part where you don't drop it. Um, so let me stick it under the other camera again, just so you can see. And then we'll munch around cameras here. Find my mouse. So here's my fully populated board. Got all the parts on it. It gets blurry up close, but there it is. All the parts are stuffed on there, as neat as I can make them. Again, I didn't put the antenna on there and I'm gonna just manually solder it on later. So now let me rearrange my camera setup here. 